Well, welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us at Mechanics Institute Online now that we've solved of our technical problems. Uh, we're very pleased to welcome you for our program uh, with author Nicole Pearl Ross for her new book, This Is How They Tell Me the World Ends, The Cyber Weapons Arms Race. I hope, and she'll be in conversation with Lindsay Tonziker. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events at the Mechanics Institute. And we are very proud to co-sponsor our program with Goethe Institute and with Gray Area for our Tech and the Series, Tech and the Cities series. Um, if you're new to Mechanics Institute, we are founded in 1854, and we're one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural institutions in the heart of downtown San Francisco. And good news, the library is open, so please come down and see us. Um, our talk will be followed by Q&A, so please hold your questions and you can put them in the chat uh, for um, the end of the program. And if you'd like to purchase uh, Nicole's new book, This is How They Tell Me the World Ends, um, please purchase it through alexanderbook.com or one of your local independent bookstores. Now I'd like to introduce our program. Uh, filled with spies, hackers, arm dealers, and a few unsung heroes, this is how they tell me the world ends, is an astonishing feat of journalism. Based on years of reporting and hundreds of interviews, Nicole Perlroth lifts the curtain on a market in shadow, revealing the urgent threat faced by all of us if we cannot bring the global cyber arms race to its heels and certainly this week has been one of those weeks that we've seen so much cyber activity uh, and not good news. Um, I'd like to introduce our two speakers. Nicole Kroll-Roth is an award-winning cybersecurity journalist for the New York Times where she has been optioned for both film and television. She is a regular lecturer at the Stanford Graduate School of Business and a graduate of Princeton University and Stanford University and lives in the Bay Area. Lindsay Tanziger works for Covington and Burling LLP. She helps national and multinational clients in a broad range of industries to anticipate and effectively evaluate legal and reputational risks under the federal and state data privacy and communication laws. Uh, she also assists clients to engage strategically with the uh, Federal Trade Commission, the Federal Communications Commission, the U.S. Congress, and other federal and state regulars, regulators. And she has served as Mechanics Institute's um, board secretary and is our newly appointed president of the Board of Trustees. So please welcome these two experts who will reveal what's going on behind the scenes in the cyber weapons warfare. Please welcome Lindsay Tonziger and author Nicole Perlroth. Thanks, Laura. And thanks for joining us, Nicole. I'm so excited for this conversation because we I get it's very rare that I get to nerd out on cybersecurity issues. So this is, is a very exciting forum for me. I guess I'll, I'll get kicked off. Um, you, you begin your book by talking about Edward Snowden and the Snowden revelations. And I think for a lot of average Americans, the Snowden revelations were really maybe the first time that they had heard about cybersecurity and national security and, and what the NSA was up to. Do you wanna kind of just set the stage of kind of how this all unfolded and kind of the big players in the, the, that, set, um, that you talk about in your book? And hopefully you can unmute, are you able to unmute? Hopefully, uh, thanks. Yeah, so someone has muted me and um, I can't, it says I can't unmute myself. So I swear, thank you. First of all, thank you to the Mechanics Institute for doing this. It's one of my favorite libraries. And just as someone who is a Bay Area native, it's really an honor to be doing this. And you know, I've been doing a lot of book talks and I thought I was getting really good at Zoom, but I think I'm just getting worse as the days go by. So I'm sorry for the technical difficulties, but thank you to everyone for joining us today. It, it really is an honor to be with you all. And I'm sure 
we are excited to get out there and, and see each other in person. And I hope we have that opportunity soon. So, and thank you, Lindsay, for doing this. Um, so just for, you know, to your question about the Snowden, you know, I was given, I would say very privileged access to some of the Snowden documents. They tell the story in the book, but uh, you know, the Guardian was given a large tranche of the Snowden documents. And uh, I learned a lot about press freedom in the UK and it's, it's actually severely limited compared to what we enjoy here. And so the GCHQ went to the Guardian headquarters and said, you have to destroy these hard drives and literally stood over their shoulders while they took whirring blades to the hard drives. But the one thing that the Guardian uh, did not tell the GCHQ at the time is that they had already smuggled a copy of the hard drive to the New York Times, where I was sitting with some of my colleagues at the New York Times and at the Guardian and ProPublica going through these documents. And I wasn't allowed to bring devices into this closet that we were sitting in accessing these documents. It was really hard to, to contextualize what we were seeing because the NSA has a, an acronym for everything and they love jargon. And so we were just forced to look at these documents um, and try to make sense of it all. And it really took several months before it hit me that the, the biggest takeaway from the Snowden documents was not my big takeaway from the Snowden documents. Um, you know, the big takeaway for everyone else was the Sorry, whoever's muting me, uh, please stop. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, so, 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 you know, most people's focus was on the, the phone call metadata collection programs. The hacking of Angela Merkel's cell phone was obviously a huge diplomatic disaster. I saw something different. I had just come into this project from years of reporting on Chinese cyber espionage, uh, I had been reporting on the beginning of Russia's incursions into the American power grid, uh, into our gas pipelines and oil companies. Um, and here I was thrown into this little closet at the New York Times looking at classified NSA documents. And I have to say my first reaction was, phew, you know, we're doing this too, only we're a lot better at it. Um, and you know, my second was was gratitude that that these documents were out there and we were able to have some of these discussions around the balance between security and privacy. But for my little piece of the world, what really stood out to me was the fact that the NSA clearly had a backdoor of some kind into every piece of commercial technology on the market. And throughout these documents, there were these littered references to our third party partners, our commercial partners in the security space, um, our independent contractors and brokers. And it was very clear to me that what I was seeing at a certain point was confirmation uh, of something that I had long heard rumored about, but had never really been able to get to the bottom of, which was that there was a market for our cyber vulnerabilities, that there were vulnerabilities in software that governments were procuring from hackers and adding them to stockpiles for espionage, counterintelligence, and also battlefield preparations as we started rolling software into the grid, into our nuclear plants, into our centrifuges. Uh, you know, US intelligence agencies really saw that the best way to destroy an adversary in the event of some larger geopolitical conflict could be through cyber methods. And they had started stockpiling vulnerabilities in that software too. And so seeing that confirmation only piqued my curiosity more. I wanted to know what were these programs about? What were the history of these programs? who was supplying US intelligence agencies with this raw material, these software vulnerabilities? Um, you know, at what point was the vulnerability so serious that we would go to the software makers and get them fixed? But I'm getting ahead of myself. So I'll stop there, Lindsay, and, and you ask the question. It looks like Lindsay is unmuted. Yeah. yeah, for yeah, some yeah. reason, we can't unmute ourselves. But, yeah. um, 
Yeah. So thanks. That's a, that's a really good um, kind of teeing up of the, the broader issues. And, you know, I think you, you summarize nicely that the good guys are not necessarily doing what you would expect the good guys to do, which is, you know, they're buying up these zero day exploits, these vulnerabilities that haven't been detected yet and using them to the US's advantage. But of course, other countries are trying to do the exact same thing. And one, one thing that I found really, really interesting, I'm gonna quote just a very brief amount, is a, 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 I think there was a, a senior government official that you were quoting on thanks to globalization, we not, now all relied on the same technology. American citizens, businesses, and critical infrastructure would also be vulnerable if that zero day were to come into the hands of a foreign power, cyber criminal, or rogue hacker. This paradox began to keep Pentagon officials up at night. So the idea is, you know, we're all using globally the same software, the same networks, the same devices, and so we're all equally vulnerable to these attacks that are out there. And, and the Pentagon saw that as a problem, but I was wondering if it's in some ways mutually assured, like the, the digital version of mutually assured destruction. Do you see it that way as well? Or are we, are we all just vulnerable and it's in, we're all at this? Yeah, I mean, you know, I should probably back up. I probably got it a little over my skis in my last comments, but just for everyone who doesn't know what a zero day is, um, a zero day is a flaw in some software. You know, think of it as a bug or a, an error in the code. And just the simplest, most tangible example seems to be that if I'm a hacker and I find a flaw in my iPhone iOS software that Apple doesn't know about, that Apple doesn't have a patch for, that's called a zero day. Uh, and there's the name, there's different origin stories, but people think it's because once the software maker discovers it, they've had zero days to fix it. And so if I'm a hacker and I can write a program to exploit that flaw in iOS software to read your text messages or record your phone calls or turn on your camera without you knowing or tr track your location, that's called a zero day exploit. And what I was seeing in those Snowden documents was clear proof that the US government basically had zero day exploits for every single piece of technology on the market. Everything from your firewall to antivirus software to Schneider electric industrial software that's used in power plants and grid. Um, and so, and I, I had heard murmurings that the US government was willing to pay hackers to sell them these zero day exploits. And these days you can go to certain government brokers websites, not even on the dark web, just on the regular internet and find price lists for zero day exploits. So right now the going rate for that zero day exploit I described in your iPhone is $2.5 million. If you're a hacker and you've developed that zero day exploit, you can sell that to a government broker for $2.5 million today. Uh, and clearly, you know, given that capability, what else really would a spy agency want? So it's not just the US government in this market anymore. It's almost every other government on earth, with each with its own various interests for wanting to be able to spy on people's uh, phone communications. And, and really, you know, our iPhones have become our little digital ankle bracelets. So anything a spy agency would want, they can probably get from your iPhone. So that is the market we're talking about. And I really wanted to know the history of this market. And I learned that it started three decades ago. Uh, and that that's really when US government agencies started paying outside hackers and intermediaries to turn over zero day exploits with the caveat that they never tell the software maker about it, that they never tell Apple about it. Because the minute Apple finds out about it, they develop a patch, they put it into a software update, you get an annoying prompt on your phone to update your software, and then that $2.5 million investment has turned to mud or dust. So three decades ago, there wasn't this real moral hazard or security dilemma baked into this market because we were all using different technology. Now, if the US government found or procured a zero day exploit in Huawei, uh, you know, no harm, no foul to Americans, because for the most part, Americans weren't using Huawei. Well, 
three decades later, you know, Huawei is a glaring exception, thanks in large part to a lot of lobbying by U.S. government um, to get American businesses not to use Huawei, and then now more recently our allies, although that's that's faltering. But for the most part, we're all using iPhones and Android phones and Schneider Electric and Siemens Industrial Software, and you might not have a PC, but Windows is now baked into the power grid and water treatment facilities. So when the U.S. government stockpiles a major flaw in Microsoft Windows and doesn't tell Microsoft about it to get it fixed, they are logically leaving Americans less safe. And the stakes for that decision I could see were only growing uh, higher, the more digitized uh, the world became. And it was also clear that our adversaries had made the calculus that well, they could not match the United States in terms of our military spending, they could do a lot of damage with cyber. They could steal our intellectual property, they could spy on our CEOs, they could uh, you know, attack our banks, they could get into the power grid, and they could pull off some of the attacks that are actually unwinding right now that we're seeing on our pipelines and our food supply and our hospitals. And that is what we are seeing now. And so the goal with the book was really to call this out, to say, hey, wait a minute. You know, the United States may, might still be the world's top dog when it comes to our offensive capabilities, but we are also now the most, or one of the most targeted states, on, nation states on earth uh, by cyber attacks. And arguably, we're among the most vulnerable because we are so digitized, because we've just been rolling software into every nook and cranny of our economy and our critical infrastructure. Uh, and so, you know, we have a lot of systems of interest that any adversaries or even some quasi allies would want to get access to. One of... Um... So that sounds like a big problem. So you do you do raise some potential solutions, and one of them is this idea of you know rather than paying for the exploits, maybe we should pay for better security. You know, really incentivize companies to build more secure software. Um, do you want to talk about that solution a little bit, or any other ways that you, maybe we can sleep a little bit better at night? There is some hope. <laughs> uh, well. Um... You know, it was, I have to say, it was really awkward as a journalist to present solutions. You know, journalists are guilty of highlighting the problems, but we always feel a little uncomfortable coming out uh, with ideas about solutions because at the end of the day, I'm not a technical person. You know, I'm not technically an expert. But when you write a book of this length and you've spent seven years of your life, I feel like you are negligent if you don't offer your own ideas for solutions. And, you know, I'm a different, you know, this, this book is also my journey. It's, it's my learning journey. I really felt like there were no real heroes in the book. Not that I'm a hero, but I felt like it was, it, it, the book needed, because it's such a technical subject matter, it needed a lay person to grab the reader by the hand and lead them around, you know, the cafeteria to this table where the hackers are sitting and this table where the three letter agencies are sitting. And here's what the foreign officials are doing and say, you know, here, meet these people. Let's sit in their table for a while and try and understand their motivations. And then let's go over here and try and understand their motivations. And by the end, you know, I, I it's also my learning journey. So you know, in the beginning, I just have all these questions like, wait a minute, you know, isn't this horrible that we're stockpiling these zero days? Doesn't this leave everyone less safe? By the end, I think I come away with it uh, with a more nuanced perspective, which is not, let's, let's not, I, I, I wouldn't, I'm not so naive as to say, let's turn over every zero day we find, uh, you know, clearly they have some intelligence value. But I do think it's really important that we talk about <laughs> this market, this space, that we drag it out into the open more, into the sunlight. Um, because I do think at the end of the day, what you're trading on is American cybersecurity in the name of national security without realizing that they've become one in the same. You know, I do think the next war will be 
a cyber war, or will it at least involve some major digital component? And I think the country that will win that war isn't necessarily the world's top uh, player when it comes to offense. I think it will be a country that is effectively a cyber iron dome that can exist with hostile activity all around it. And that's not the United States. You know, we are among the most vulnerable nations on earth. We have spent all of our calories on offense and very little on defense. And, and it's nuanced. The reason that is, is, is very nuanced. One is defense is hard. It's grueling. You know, it's things like password management and two-factor authentication and segmenting the hardest parts of your network or the most precious parts of your network from everything else. It's also particularly difficult in the United States where the vast majority of our critical systems, power, water, gas, is owned and operated and maintained and secured by the private sector. And every time we've tried to pass legislation that says you need to meet this bare minimum standard of cybersecurity, lobbyists have come in and said, no, we're not going to do this. It's too expensive and it's too burdensome for these businesses. So we're left uh, sort of handcuffed a little bit with our defense. And so some of the ideas I've presented are, you know, if we're going to be, if we're going to basically be in this place where we're not going to accept regulation, then I think we have to be very creative with how we deal with market incentives. And so some of the ideas I've presented are, you know, tax breaks for companies that have proven that they have met that bare minimum of security, you know, that have basically done things like subjected their themselves to a real penetration test where hackers would come in, you know, the white hat hackers would come in, uh, try to attack their systems, show them where they're vulnerable, and then three months later do it again. And they can say, look, you know, we were no longer using a decade old version of Windows. We have two factor authentication turned on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that would get us to a better place. Now, it wouldn't stop the kind of sophisticated Russian supply chain hacks that we're seeing right now, what we're calling solar winds, but it would get most companies to a place where they could probably withstand about 80% of the cyber threats that they face, including the ransomware attacks that we're seeing right now. You know, Colonial Pipeline felt like such a, a mega event, a terrorist attack on some level. Well, what did it come down to? How did it happen? It happened because Colonial Pipeline forgot to deactivate an old employee's account and that they never turned two-factor authentication on for. That's all it took to take out uh, you know, a conduit for half the gas and jet fuel and diesel to the East Coast. And one of the things that we learned in that reporting was we got our hands on this classified DOE assessment that said the United States actually could have only afforded as a country two or three more days of downtime from the colonial pipeline before chemical refineries ground to a halt because they, re they require diesel, before mass transit ground to a halt. So that's how vulnerable we are. Um, and so we need to figure out ways to get us up to the standard. And, and you know, our adversaries like China, for instance, they can go to their state-owned enterprises and say, you need to secure yourself. <laughs> you need to pull out this old software. You need to patch your systems. You need to have two-factor authentication. We can't do that here. And so we have to work within incentive models. So tax breaks is just one idea. Um, one of the things, one of the sort of room for optimism, I think, is I actually, and it's awkward sometimes to say as a journalist, um, but I have to say that this administration, the Biden administration, has really been stuck holding the hot potato on these issues. You know, previous administrations basically crossed their fingers and hoped that we wouldn't be where we are today. And now here is Biden holding the hot potato. So, you know, room for optimism is his cyber team is top notch. Actually, one of my favorite quotes in the book belongs to Chris Inglis, who has just been nominated for National Cybersecurity Director. 
he spent his, most of his career at NSA on the offensive side of the house. But the quote is, and I'm gonna botch the numbers, but the quote is that if we were to score cyber the way we score a soccer game, the, the score would be something like 452 to 462, 20 minutes into the game. In other words, it's been all offense and there's no defense. We've never even put a goalie in. And so that quote <laughs> gives me hope. You know, here's someone who spent his entire career on the offensive side of the house recognizing it's time to put some goalies in. And they've been very creative with what they just did with the new Biden uh, cyber executive order that Biden recently signed. One thing they did was they said, uh, you know, listen, we'll cut out a lot of the red tape, but we will ask that you, you know, we'll put out a list of standards, best practices, and it'll include things like two-factor authentication and backing up your data uh, and password management and patch management and not using old out-of-date software. And we'll even let you self-certify that you meet this standard. We won't make you go to some third party auditor and pay some fee for some compliance checklist. You can self-certify. But if we catch you lying to us, you know, if you get hit by a ransomware attack that came down to someone coming in through an old employee account that didn't have two-factor authentication turned on, you can never do business with the federal government again. That is a really critical stick. Because when you think about Colonial Pipeline, for instance, you know, they are a private company, but they butt up against federal systems. And so if the executive order had been in place and they had self-certified uh, and were caught lying and getting hacked through this old employee account, it, would, it might make them commercially unviable. So, so they are working within the system, they're working with the constraints of the system and using the power of the government's purse to try and get companies to up level on cybersecurity. And that's an important tool. Um, the other room for optimism is right now we we're, we're hitting rock bottom. <laughs> you know, we, between solar winds, which, which, you know, just to linger there for a second, this was a case of Russia's elite intelligence agency, the SVR, using a major software company as a conduit to break into the Department of Energy, our nuclear labs, the Department of Homeland Security, Justice, Treasury, on and on and on. Microsoft, FireEye, one of the nation's preeminent cybersecurity firms. We know the SBR. We know them actually pretty well because they actually hacked the White House and the State Department in 2014, 2015. And when I went and interviewed the people who cleaned up that attack, they said, we'd never seen anything like it. It was, quote, hand-to-hand -hand digital combat. They would, they would find a Russian SVR hacker in a digital hallway, and instead of scurrying off, they would stay and fight to keep their access. At one point, they even took over investigators' tools and manipulated them so they wouldn't find some of their other backdoors. So that's who we're dealing with, who was in our federal systems for more than nine months before we even discovered them. And it'll be a year or so before we can confidently say we've eradicated them, if ever. So, you know, here Biden, they've, they've inherited communication channels that they can't trust. We're getting hit by ransomware attacks that are increasingly visceral. Uh, you know, for the first time, Americans can see with their own eyes how vulnerable the U.S. has become. Uh, you know, China is hacking us using far more sophisticated techniques than they were 10 years ago when I first started covering Chinese cyber espionage and new players have come on the scene um, and in a way that the U.S. didn't think they'd be ready to for another decade or longer. So, you know, all, all we're waiting for now is that big cyber boom, cyber Pearl Harbor, whatever you want to call it. Um, but my goal with the book was to say before we get there, uh, let's just take a look around at where we are. It's not that great. And I think the Biden administration recognizes that they have no choice but to address this problem and to ask some of these really hard questions about the software supply chain, about vendor security, about how we're uh, you know, locking up our own federal systems. Um, you know, it's never been more clear that you know, even, even mutually assured destruction, mutually assured digital destruction 
you know, we, we have hacked into the Russian grid. We have taken out North Korean missiles using cyber methods. We have plans uh, to take out the power in Iran, but that has not deterred our enemies. Uh, from hacking us. So it's never been more clear that offense alone will not get us out of this mess. And I think the, the right people are in the right jobs. It's just that this is a really hard problem to solve. Um, but I've never been more hopeful that things will get better. That said, I think we're in for a lot of short-term pain. But I think finally, people are are asking the right questions. And, you know, uh, the, the last four years were incredibly frustrating to be covering cybersecurity. There was a lot going on, <laughs> but any anything that was done for U.S. cybersecurity and cyber defense during the Trump administration was either done under cover of darkness uh, at the NSA or at Cyber Command, or was done at the kids' table with some of the efforts that that DHS and CISA were trying to do to secure the 2020 election. And you know, in, in both cases, no one wanted to tell the White House what they were doing. Uh, at least now we have an administration in there who's getting up to the podium and talking about ransomware and repercussions and bringing it up with Putin at the top of the agenda, et cetera. Yeah, and just building off of that, um, because we're in San Francisco and I feel like you can't go five minutes without somebody mentioning cryptocurrency, you know, there's a big criticism of cryptocurrency has always been, well, it allows cyber criminals to hide because you can't follow the money. So I think it was actually really encouraging in connection with the colonial pipeline attack that the Biden administration seemed to figure out a way to follow the money and, and follow the crypto and, and find out who was behind it and, and take action that way. And they were very vocal and transparent um, perhaps to deter other cyber criminals who thought that they could get away with it because of, you know, the, the, the money wasn't traceable. Mm -hmm. Of course, that only affects cyber criminals motivated by financial um, benefit. It doesn't necessarily pre um, prevent us against the espionage and the sabotage elements of, of cyber attacks. But um, do you think that also helps that maybe cryptocurrency isn't the vehicle that we once feared it would be? Well, it's really interesting. You know, I sort of just was running from forest fire to forest fire and um, from ransomware attack to ransomware attack. And my knee jerk reaction was, this is the, the fuel for these fires, for these ransomware attacks has been cryptocurrency because I actually covered the first ransomware attacks in the United States back in, I think it was 2012. And back then it was um, uh, cyber criminals demanding $200 from individual PC users. And they would say, okay, go to your local drugstore, get a prepaid debit card, give us you know, the number of the card and your pin, and that's how you'll pay us, okay? Then cryptocurrency happened. And now you're seeing ransom demands of $50 million. Last weekend, it was $70 million. And crypto has made it a lot easier for uh, you know, cyber criminals to make these outrageous ransom demands. And the idea was that they were untraceable. And so for the last six months, I think up until uh, the Colonial Pipeline incident, I just thought, wow, cryptocurrency is, is really, or sorry, ransomware is really gonna be the Achilles heel for cryptocurrency. You know, this is gonna be, uh, this is going to force governments to really put a kibosh on some of these cryptocurrency exchanges uh, that don't enforce anti-money laundering laws and know your customer, et cetera, et cetera. So what was interesting was then we see the DOJ and the FBI come out a couple of weeks ago and say we were able to recoup some of Colonial Pipeline's ransom demand. And really, that was their effort to course, turn the tables on cyber criminals, but also to try to incentivize companies uh, to tip off the federal government to their attacks, which is something that wasn't happening for a really long time. Most companies just want to bury this, pretend it didn't happen because they worry about what will happen to their stock price or class action lawsuits or just the brand damage that could happen from that. So I think it was this administration's way of saying, tell us, and we might be able to help you get your money back. So 
I went and interviewed um, a couple of people around the Bay actually. The, the new wave of startup that I think is actually really interesting is blockchain intelligence companies. These are companies that trace payments along the blockchain, um, along the public ledger that, that Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies rely on. And uh, what they told me, and by the way, the people working for these blockchain intelligence companies are former treasury officials who handled counterterrorism and financial intelligence for the treasury. And I was shocked by what they were telling me. They, were, they said, no, 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 you don't understand. To trace this kind of ransom payment in fiat currency, you know, in cash, would take us years. We would have to go from bank to bank to bank, from front company to front company, finally to the Seychelles, you know, work, partner with law enforcement in the Seychelles to recoup these funds. It could take years. Now we can actually do it in real time. We can trace these, the movement of these payments in real time. And then it gets to good old fashioned police work at the end of the day of how to actually get those funds out of the wallet, whether it's, you know, serving, you probably know better, better than I do, Lindsay, but, you know, serving uh, a, a subpoena or, you know, search warrant of some kind to a cryptocurrency exchange or hacking a cyber criminal's computer, getting their password and recouping the funds that way, getting their private key that way. So it's interesting. It's basically cryptocurrency. My takeaway now is much more nuanced. It's much more, it's a blessing and a curse. It's been fuel for these ransom demands, but also it makes these payments much more traceable. Now, the question is if DOJ and the FBI could, could recoup almost half of what Colonial paid for their ransom payment, you know, what are they going to do for JBS, the Brazilian company that was the meat processing company that that was hijacked a couple of weeks ago, or what will they do for, you know, other companies that have paid their ransom? Like it was, was this a one-off or is this scalable or will cyber criminals just move to some of these more anonymous uh, cryptocurrencies like Monero, uh, which is harder to trace, or will they make sure to only use crypto, uh, cryptocurrency exchanges to withdraw funds in places like Romania or you know different places where they don't have um, we don't have law enforcement collaboration and cooperation. You know, it's always the story of security has always been a cat and mouse game, and so we made this one leap. But what's going to happen next? And chances are, it's going to keep doing this. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. And. You know, kind of switching gears slightly, we've been focused a lot on security, but to kind of cross the bridge to privacy for just a second, um, as a result of a lot of these, um, can you guys hear me? Okay, there we go. I thought it was on mute. Um, I, what, as a result of a lot of this coming to light, Snowden and everything else in terms of what the U.S. government is doing in terms of national security and, and law enforcement surveillance, um, it resulted in Europe, the invalidation of the mechanism that businesses use to get data out of Europe into the United States. So through a series of court actions and challenges, it's very difficult now and is quite uncertain whether or not companies can take data out of Europe and access it from the United States. And so, you know, your book talks about how all these different governments around the world are doing the exact same thing. So I, I'm just wondering if you have a perspective on kind of, um, is the privacy impact uniquely a United States issue? Or is this really a worldwide issue? And this idea that, oh, the US is the one that's doing all this surveillance, um, missing the point. Well, you know, there was a lot of talk about the balkanization of the internet after Snowden. You know, Brazil was demanding that only Brazilian data centers would hold Brazilian data. And the fundamental misconception with that is that the NSA spies on foreign systems. <laughs> They're really only hamstrung when it comes to spying on domestic systems. So by just keeping their data in Brazil, 
it doesn't really stop the NSA for, from spying on that data. Um, so, you know, that's sort of my general take on, on just whether balkanization of, of data uh, hamstrings US surveillance, it, it does not. Um, and, you know, the other thing is, uh, you know, they, they can't go to Google maybe and say, hand us this, you know, if, if it's just a, a European company and the U.S. goes goes to them, they might not be able to go to them the same way that they have been through FISA with national security letters to Google, to Apple, to Microsoft, et cetera. Um, but we certainly saw that they are more than capable of hacking into those data centers and grabbing that data. And that is their job, essentially. So, you know, the idea that somehow the data will be better protected for foreigners by keeping it in house, I think, is a little bit of a fallacy. Um, the other thing that's that is interesting, actually, on on the privacy front as it relates to security, is uh, solar winds. So, you know, we have been hacking into foreign systems. This is a policy that Paul Nakasone, the director of NSA and Cyber Command at the Pentagon calls uh, defend forward, active defense. And the idea is we'll hack into Russia's power grid as, as a show of mutually assured digital destruction because they've been planting code in our grid for a long time. And, and my colleague, David Sanger, and I broke that story. And actually when we went to the National Security Council before we published a story and said, hey, we're about to publish a story uh, in the New York Times, it says you've been hacking into the Russian grid and making a pretty loud show of it, what say you? We thought we were in for a pretty painful conversation. Instead, the NSC said, we have no problem with you publishing this story. <laughs> we want Russia to know that we're hacking into their grid. You know, We want them to know that should they do anything here, we'll just turn around and do the same thing there. Um, but the other idea behind active defense and defend forward is that by somehow hacking into adversary systems, we would get an early warning alert or early warning system set up to, to get ahead of attacks on the United States as they were being plotted and planned and before they could execute on US systems. And what we learned with solar winds was that that is actually a fallacy too. You know, that the, they were in our systems, our federal agencies for nine months before FireEye, a private company, discovered that it had been breached and only in unwinding its own attack did it realize that the attackers had come in through SolarWinds, the software from this Texas company. And then we learned that Russia had set up their servers, their command and control servers, all in the United States through things like GoDaddy in New Jersey. And that is precisely where the NSA can't look. They can't look at that kind of domestic traffic. So really, they've exploited our privacy protections against us, just like Russia, I think, for the last five, six years, has been exploiting our First Amendment uh, against us with some of its disinformation, misinformation campaigns on social media. So what's clear to me is they really have our number. And you know, without compromising on privacy, how do we solve for this? And I think that's a really hard question. You know, there was an executive order, one of the last that Trump signed, uh, which, which would require uh, hosting services to know foreign customers and, and which foreigners were using their services inside the United States. And I haven't been tracking it closely to see how, how that's been executed upon. But that is my biggest concern with privacy is that our adversaries have recognized that they can really turn the tables on us with regard to our privacy protections. And by hacking the United States from inside our borders where the NSA can't look, uh, they, can, they can have a lot more success. And it's not just Russia. We actually just saw China do the same thing with, with um, this attack that was recently discovered on Microsoft Exchange systems, which are basically emails, email servers. Uh, China staged their attack from inside the United States to knowing that, that is that is not where the NSA operates and and uh, you know the way we, we track that kind of activity uh, is very bureaucratic it's you know the NSA might catch a wind of some kind of operation either through digital means through hacking or through some human intelligence 
they would pass that to the FBI and then ostensibly the FBI could go investigate. But, you know, these hacks happen so quickly um, and the hackers are so flexible and malleable, much more so than our bureaucracy here, that it, it hasn't been working very well. And so I really worry about, you know, the next chapter that we're, you know, the, the solar winds is not the first time we're going to see a software supply chain attack staged from inside the United States. And what, what do we do to prevent that is, is a really hard problem. Well, I, I have so many more questions, but I wanna open it up to the floor. And I think um, Laura or Pam will, will take it from here with some of the questions that have been entered into the chat. Yes, um, Pam Choi, our events assistant is gonna read off uh, questions from the chat. Um, okay, I, this is, I'm reading Brian, and I, again, I apologize if this, if any of these questions have been covered in the talk. There's been so much said, uh, but Brian asks, so I read the NSA lost control of their library of these exploits. Is that true? And did anyone get fired for that? Sorry, do you mind reading it again? I'm sorry. Brian asks, I read that the NSA lost control of their library of these exploits. Is that true? And did anyone get fired for that? Great question. So when I sold this book, it was 2013. And I was writing about this exploit market. And I was asking questions about sort of the moral hazard baked into this market and the security implications of this market. Um, one question I never even bothered to ask because my imagination wasn't even capable of it at the time was what happens when the NSA's own stockpile of all of these zero day exploits gets hacked. And that is what happened. And to me, this is the biggest story, far bigger than anything we learned from Snowden. But when I covered it on the front pages of the New York Times, for whatever reason, probably because it's so technical, it never really stuck in the American consciousness for long. And that's when I really knew I needed to get this book done because I knew I needed to communicate what a big deal that was, um, especially in the context of everything else I've been investigating. You know, that really what happened was the NSA's exploits were stolen. We don't know by who, we still don't know by who, but sometime in 2016, in the fall of 2016, when everyone else was distracted with the election, someone appeared on Twitter, they called themselves the shadow brokers, and they claimed to uh, have access to some of the NSA's hacking tools. And at first, no one believed them. But then over a period of several months, they started dribbling out some of the NSA's hacking tools. And it was very clear that these were the real deal. I would call up former NSA hackers and say, what is this? And they said, this is the, the, this, these are the keys to the kingdom. And in early 2017, something horrible happened. They dumped the mother load of these exploits, zero day exploits for Microsoft Windows software, some of the most widely used commercial software on the market. And what some of these tools did was, if you could break into a Microsoft uh, Windows uh, system, you know, sometimes a hacker would manually go server to server looking for goods to, to siphon off. Well, this NSA tool automated that process. So it allowed, it allowed the code to basically do the searching for you. So the NSA used this tool, it was called Eternal Blue, that was the code name for it, for counterintelligence. And when I asked uh, about this, of these former NSA hackers, they said, this was, this tool was getting us some of the best intelligence you could ever even imagine on terrorists. We never seriously considered turning this over to Microsoft. Uh, and we thought that it was so hard to perfect this zero day exploit that no one else could possibly use it, but they never anticipated that one day someone would hack them or an insider would come in and take it and dump it online. But that's what happened. So in March, around March, 2017, they dropped this mother load of NSA exploits. One of the first things that happened was North Korea picked it up for a global ransomware attack that hit British hospitals, that hit companies all over the world, but they were a little bit sloppy in the attack. And so someone, a hacker in the UK, was actually able to neutralize the attack pretty quickly. 
But then one month later, Russia picked up the NSA's tools and they used it in an attack on Ukraine that looked like ransomware, but actually wasn't ransomware at all. There was no way for victims to pay the ransom. It was, it was just a tool of destruction. And it took out uh, Ukrainian government agencies. People could get gas at the gas station. They couldn't get money out of ATMs. Grocery stores were frozen. Even at the old Chernobyl nuclear site, the radiation monitors, the, the monitors that monitor the levels of radiation off of the old leak site uh, went down. But it also hit any business that that had any kind of operation in Ukraine, even a single employee working remotely from Ukraine. So it hit FedEx. It did $400 million in damage to FedEx. It hit Merck. Merck had to tap into the CDC's emergency uh, stockpiles of the Gardasil vaccine that year because their factory production went down in the attack. On and on and on. It, 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 took, it cost us $10 billion in damage. And there really has been very little accountability for that uh, leak and those attacks but someone was fired and it was Mike Rogers who was the head of the NSA at the time uh, because th there was no accountability. We still don't know. You know. Maybe someone inside the NSA knows who the shadow brokers were, but we don't know. And for the book, I actually went and interviewed Mike Rogers and I asked him, do you, how well do you sleep at night after this? And he said, I sleep just fine. And I said, do you feel like you bear any responsibility for what happened? You know, the NSA's tool is getting leaked. They're getting picked up by North Korea and Russia and getting used on American businesses and critical systems. And he said, uh, the analogy he used was, Nicole, if Toyota makes a pickup truck and someone else comes along and takes that pickup truck and bolts a bomb onto the front of it and drives it into a crowd of people and it explodes, does Toyota bear responsibility for that attack? And, you know, think what you will about that analogy, but I think what's clear is he felt very little responsibility for what happened. And I have a different position. I think that the NSA bore a lot of responsibility for that attack. Um, and that, you know, unfortunately the lessons were lost too quickly or no, no one wanted to really acknowledge what was happened, what happened, let alone um, talk about how to prevent something like that in the future. And that was, that became a big part of my book was really calling that out and, and adding a narrative to it so people could understand what a big deal it was that basically we let our best weapons get away and we just handed them to our adversaries. And for a long time, the US had first mover advantage. We had the best cyber capabilities, but what happened in those attacks was the capabilities gap closed significantly. You know, North Korea would have never been able to develop that zero day exploit on its own at this stage. They're just not there yet, but we just handed them the goods. And so it was a really, really big deal. Um, Bob Mueller's question. I've noticed, hold on. I've noticed that media accounts hardly ever give details of how hackers break into systems initially. What is your take on why reporters don't dive down into the attack vectors, the way the hackers open the door to their hacks? This would really help vulnerable entities see what they're doing wrong. Well, we do, um, but they do get lost in the story sometimes. You know, for like, it's, it's the, the hardest part of my job is balancing audiences, you know, writing for a lay audience about something that's very technical. But I think you're right that it's really important to call out how these attacks happen. So if you look at some of my recent reporting, uh, I talk about how Colonial Pipeline was breached because of a lack of two-factor authentication in an old employee account and stolen password. How the water treatment hack that was terrifying back in February when a hacker got into a water treatment facility in Florida and was able to actually up the level of lye, L-Y-E, in the water um, to a point where they could have badly poisoned the population, except it was caught, fortunately. That was enabled because they were using a decade-old version of Windows that couldn't even get patches if they wanted to because Microsoft no longer supports it. You know, I've talked all day on Twitter about how 
um, you know, 80% of the ransomware attacks are enabled because of a lack of two-factor authentication. Um, and then I spend a lot of time in my book talking about, you know, the fact that so much of this comes through phishing, et cetera, but that the capabilities are getting far more sophisticated and now it's with zero days. And those are really hard to defend against, um, which is why I think we have to change our calculus from let's hold on to every zero day we find or we buy off off the underground market for these things to if we're going to hold on to this we should only hold on to it for as long as our operation lasts you know as long let's use it just to get in and then let's turn it over once we're done with it and we haven't been doing that that eternal blue exploit i mentioned earlier we held on to it for, for more than five years that's a really long time to hold on to a critical zero day in Microsoft Windows, the most widely used software on the market, software we bake into our critical systems here in the United States. But again, you know, the answer I was getting from, from NSA folks was, this was getting our best intelligence, you don't understand. And it's like, okay, well, it might have, may have gotten your best intelligence. It also enabled the most destructive cyber attack on the United States. <laughs> In, in history. So we need to factor that into some of our decision making. But I think you're right. You know, I think a lot of people, the, the, the hardest part is when you talk about, when you use terms like cyber Pearl Harbor, and you're covering nation state attacks all day, the worst side effect of that is that it gives people the impression that the situation is hopeless, and that there's nothing they can do. And that's not true. It's, it's a little bit like the pandemic, where Yes, governments have a huge say. Uh, yes, businesses have a huge say in developing a vaccine and in some of their corporate policies. But individuals have a big role too in social distancing and wearing a mask. And the same is true in cyber. You know, it is up to us to use two-factor authentication. I've said it, you know, 20 times during this talk. Um, and different passwords, because often the way that these attackers get into organizations is through the weakest link and the weakest link continues to be employees who click on phishing emails and use dumb passwords and don't use two-factor authentication. Um, so, you know, we all have a role to play. And that's another reason I really wanted to write a book for a lay audience, because I wanted people to understand that we really all do have a very important role to play in securing ourselves, in securing whoever we work for, um, and also creating some of the domestic pressure that I think it'll take on the US government to make defense, cyber defense, more of a priority to rebalance uh, between offense and defense. Um, and so, you know, that was always the goal. Uh, this next question is from Carol Verberg. Do you see security problems with the US mass switch from fossil fuel to electricity? Are backup systems possible for large grids? So the hard part, and it's, it's so hard to say because I actually, you know, in terms of global threats, I mean, we're in the Bay Area. I know we're all terrified about this year's fire season. For me, climate change is up here and cybersecurity is down here and maybe disinformation is right here in terms of, of global and national uh, security threats right now. But a lot of answers and proposed solutions to climate change uh, you know, rest on digitizing everything, on electric cars um, and that creates more opportunities for hackers. And, uh, you know, the, my answer to this is that shouldn't stop us from moving to more of these efficient systems. But uh, I think it's time that we recognize that Microsoft wrote Windows for desktop computers. It didn't write it for cars. You know, Linux was written for desktop computers and PCs. It wasn't written for our water treatment facilities. So one little uh, iota of hope <laughs> is that when I interviewed all of these shady zero day brokers for the book and hackers, I would ask them, is there anything you haven't been able to hack? And there was one. And it was this little company in Santa Barbara called Green Hills Software. I tried to reach out to them before 
my book published and they never got back to me. And only after the book published, did they just reach out to me? But I finally was able to interview them. And, and what they said was that their first project was creating an operating system for the B1B intercontinental missile delivery system that the Pentagon had come to them and asked them to do this. And so they knew that they'd had to make the code secure because they would not be able to fix anything after the fact with a remote software update because those, that remote access could be exploited by an adversary to turn our weapon systems against us. So they said, I wish I could tell you it was a magic algorithm, Nicole, uh, that made our, our software more secure, but it wasn't. It was just that we went line by line by line and we vetted every single line of code to make sure it was secure, that there were no errors, that there could be no zero days. And then they went and they sent it to the Pentagon where the NSA actually tested it for a period of six months and said, yes, actually this is secure. And they baked it into our weapon systems. So now their software is used in F-16s. It's used in a lot of, of missile delivery systems in the United States. Basically their biggest market is, is the Pentagon um, or biggest customer is the Pentagon. But you could see a world where that's the kind of software we're going to use for safety critical systems like electric cars, autonomous, self-driving cars, um, you know, more the grid, uh, et cetera. And I hope that's where we go. I really hope that's where we go. Um, and then for backup power for, um, uh, you know, when that just reminds me that when, when Russia took out the power uh, in Ukraine, they made sure to take out the backups too. Um, and I'm not uh, an expert on the power grid, but I was struck by how carefully um, they designed that attack to make it harder for Ukraine to get the power back on. They went as far as to turn the lights off in the building where the engineers would have to go uh, to turn the lights back on and, and restart everything um, so that they were fumbling around in the dark with flashlights. I mean, that is the lengths that they go. And often one of the first things we see in ransomware attacks too is that these ransomware cyber criminals will go and find the backup systems and encrypt those first. So, you know, yes, yes, we can have, we, we should, we do need more resiliency, but we need to make very, make it be very careful about how connected those backup systems are to day-to-day -to -day business operations and that kind of thing. Um, Dennis asks, how do you differentiate the vulnerability of the nodes, i.e. colonial, versus the network itself? Can the government not mandate the network infrastructure itself be rigidized and secured? The fact that colonial had a pathway from any user account to an operational control network was pure negligence. These are different systems completely. Mm -hmm. Oh, ruggedized, sorry. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting because, um, you know, we're learning more and more about the Colonial Pipeline hack. And the issue wasn't that the ransomware got to the pipeline itself. The issue was that it took their billing systems offline. And so they had no way of charging customers downstream. And so then they took the preemptive step of shutting down the pipeline. So even though, you know, we, we believe that they have segmented the pipeline, their OT system is what it's called, from their IT systems. Uh, you know, they, they still shut down the, the pipeline because they couldn't charge customers in their business. Um, you know, what's interesting is I go to a lot of these like very niche industrial security conferences. And a few years ago, I went to one and I met a company called Waterfall Security. They're in Israel. And their only product, and I apologize, that has a very jargony name, is a unidirectional uh, diode. And what it is, is just uh, a, a way for data to only flow one direction, like a waterfall. Um, and so they work with a lot of pipeline operators in the United States. So, you know, if Colonial Pipeline had been using a unidirectional diode on the pipeline, they would have been able to capture data about where the, the outflows were and would have been able to continue to build customers, uh, but they didn't have that. Um, and so that is, I think, another you know, 
possible solution to some of these, these systems where, it, yes, you should segment them, but often that segmentation is very difficult. And what you need in between is not just to have them completely uh, segregated, but to have something like a unidirectional diode in between so you can still capture data off that critical system, um, but that you know malware or ransomware can spread in. And so in Colonial Pipeline's case, that would have prevented what happened next. And I'm sure they probably signed up with Waterfall or one of their competitors after this attack. But I hope that answers the question. Cass Kerrigan uh, asks, the NSA is tasked with both gathering intelligence and defending against attacks. These roles feel antithetical to each other. In order to defend against security issues, don't we have to release the zero day vulnerabilities to fix the issues? Would it be more effective to have separate agencies independently tasked for offense and defense? Yeah, this has been a big question for a really long time. You know, shouldn't we separate the offense side of the house from the defense side of the house? And it is true. There's, there is a legitimate argument for that. You know, I say in the book, I forget what the ratio is now, but it's something like for every one engineer working on defense at the NSA, uh, making secure code, there are 100 breaking code. Um, and so it's always been tilted more towards offense. The energy has always been on offense. I think the ratio was even higher than that. I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but Ed Giorgio gave a talk. He was, he worked at the NSA and he worked on the offensive side of the house and the defensive side of the house. He gave a talk at RSA, the San Francisco security conference a few years ago, where he said when he was on the defensive side of the house, he led a team of, you know, maybe 17, I think it was, uh, engineers. And then when he worked on the offensive side of the house, it was 1700. Uh, engineers. And so there's always been this imbalance and there has always been people saying that we need to separate, um, separate these operations into different agencies. And the reality is more complicated, you know, to be a really good defender, you need to really understand offense and you really need to know what the best, most novel offensive modes are and methods and techniques are. And I think that is a very legitimate argument too, that you know, the NSA is the best at what it does worldwide. Why would you want to divorce uh, that knowledge base and those people and those resources from the defensive side of the house? So I don't know if that's our solution. And then when you look at um, agencies like DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, which is charged with our cyber defense, you know, unfortunately, it's been sort of this bureaucratic letdown for a long time. Um, and even just in terms of recruiting, we have a huge talent shortage in the United States for engineers, let alone uh, cybersecurity focused engineers. And so we've tried to replenish the pipeline through scholarship programs and that kind of thing. But where do most of these engineers want to go work once they've graduated from college and do their federal service? They want to go work on offense. It's always been more fun to spy and you know be a pirate than work on the Coast Guard um, side of the house. And so it, we've, we've had a long uh, drawn out problem of getting uh, engineers to work on defense uh, at, at DHS or to work on shoring up the Pentagon security and that kind of thing. So. So it's difficult. Um, I think one of the things that I think has been heartening, and I talk about this in the book a little bit, is the Pentagon, which was notoriously a closed box who would you know, threaten or arrest anyone who probed its systems for, for vulnerabilities, now has opened its doors and said, you know, please hack us and let us know where you find vulnerabilities and we'll reward you for that with a bug bounty program with bounties with payments. Um, They've also done private uh, private bug bounty operations where they'll work with these companies, many of them based in the Bay Area, that crowdsource um, you know, these hacks, these sort of penetration tests to hackers uh, in their network who will come and will you know, probe uh, you know, the F-16 or some backend system at the Pentagon, turn over vulnerabilities so the Pentagon can patch them. And that's sort of a creative way to get people who specialize in offense to work on defense. 
Um, and I think that again, you know, we don't, the, the government in the United States, I'm sorry to say, only protects .gov and .mil. They don't protect .com. Um, and that's always a shocker to people. It was, it was a huge eye opener for me when the New York Times was hacked by China and I got to embed with our security team and the FBI came and we told them everything we'd learned. And they said, thank you very much. They put it in their binders and they walked out and we never heard from them again. You know, it is not their job to protect the New York Times. Maybe sometimes they'll share threat data with us. And that's the, the direction we're going is trying to improve the sharing of threat intelligence between the public and private sector. But again, you know, this is a really hard problem to solve for cyber defense in a free market economy where we don't want the NSA sitting in our corporate systems or our private systems, you know, monitoring traffic as it's going in and out. And the compromise we make uh, in, in the name of privacy is for security. And there are other countries like Israel where they have made a bigger compromise on privacy. They've let the Israeli cyber defense essentially sit inside some of these critical systems and monitor for threats and block them as they come. Um, and they've made that trade off because they're Israel and, and they see their, their defense and national security as the top priority above everything else. Here in the United States, our value system is still very different. And so we have to operate within these constraints, um, which is why you know solving these issues is it's just much more difficult, especially when you're trying to solve for them in a hyper-partisan uh, government and environment. JP asks, there was nearly zero focus on the IT security vulnerability related to scenes of the physical capital breach and open logged in computers of various US representatives. Do you have any comments on that? No, you know, in a previous life, I worked at the Capitol. Um, and you'd be surprised how much, how, how elementary <laughs> some of their technology is. I'm not downplaying, downplaying the threat at all. I'm just saying that, um, you know, there, there would have been significant hurdles for uh, the people who stormed the Capitol, the insurrectionists from getting access to any kind of classified data on those computer systems. But of course it's not impossible. And I do think that is a big vacuum for reporting. I think that is, you know, we need to do a better job of figuring out what they were able to get uh, off of those systems. Um, but, you know, just having worked at the Capitol and interviewed, uh, interviewed congressional staffers, it wasn't their, it wasn't their biggest worry. Um, and, you know, it, it, it would, there, there would have been some layers in between, you know, even use testing out passwords on some of those systems and access, accessing sensitive classified data. Uh, and who knows how, how well those layers held up. And, and one final question from Daniel Marshall. What's the name again of the company that developed software for managing missile launch systems? Green Hill. I'm gonna. I'm about to write about them for the New York Times, but you know it's tricky because you never want to write about the unhackable co company because everyone then you know finds a way to hack them. Um, but you know it gives me a little bit of comfort to know that both sh shady zero day brokers and the NSA were not able to hack their operating system. Now they found bugs in some of their other security, which I'm going to have to mention in this article. Um, not their security, some of their other software that's used for less critical systems, but the operating system that they have for what they call safety critical systems is still considered some of the most secure on the market. It's just that, um, you know, it's not considered scalable right now in the same way that, that other software is, and it doesn't have all of the neat features and bells and whistles um, that other operating systems have. But I do think there's a real, you, you could see a world where the ransomware attacks and the nation state attacks were getting so bad that we said, okay, you know, we're not going to pull out of the internet and unplug everything, but it's time to really make sure that the code is locked down. And this is just one, uh, one potential, you know, solution uh, there. Well, I want to thank uh, Nicole Prola Roth for a really 
eye-opening and also insightful uh, and somewhat frightening uh, conversation. And also want to thank Lindsay Tonziker, our new board president of the Mechanics Institute for engaging uh, in this conversation. This has been really an eye-opener and a really powerful conversation. And um, I want to encourage everyone to pick up a book. Um, at alexanderbook.com and also Nicole as we go. So thank you very much, everyone. And we'll say good night and we'll close down. See you soon. Thank you. I, I know that that was a, a technical conversation and often a little bit intimidating in this one. So I hope everyone goes and has a nice glass of wine. And thank you so much for, for joining us. So it's, it's lovely to see your faces. Thank, thank you. you. It's great. To, thank you, everybody. Um, I'm going to close down right now, but it's great to see everybody. <laughs>